Welcome to the latest edition of the Teamsters podcast. I'm Kara Dennis of the Teamsters Communications Department. In this episode, we will talk about the Teamsters participation in the Strike for Black Lives protest earlier this month and how members across the country took action to stand up for racial justice. We'll also hear from Don Castillo, the director of the Division of Safety Research for the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health, or NIOSH, who talks about the best ways for truckers to ensure they remain safe on the job during the current coronavirus pandemic. But now I turn to my colleague, Daniel Moskowitz, to learn more about the Strike for Black Lives, where Teamsters participated in a national movement confronting systemic racism and demanding solutions from government and corporations to dismantle racist policies. Daniel? Thanks, Kara. On July 20th, the Teamsters joined with Union Brothers and Sisters nationwide to take part in the Strike for Black Lives. In 15 cities across the U.S., the Teamsters joined with labor allies to protest systemic racism, and economic inequality. Marcus King, director of the Teamsters Human Rights and Diversity Commission, helped lead the day of action, telling workers across the nation and around the world that the IBT was founded on the principle of winning justice for all workers. And that cannot happen unless we dismantle racism and racist systems that continue to hold black workers back. Today, all across the United States, workers are participating in strikes for black live action. We are walking off the job, holding rallies and protesting, all to stand up for the systematic racism injustice in our country. As you all know, the civil rights movement and labor movement have always gone hand in hand. I am proud to say that the Teamsters Union has a long history of promoting workers equality regardless of race or gender, going all the way back to the 20th, 20th century. Unfortunately, the same can be said about our society as a whole, where we continue to fight for fair and equal treatment for every person. I know that your support for Black Lives Matter movement has been incredible. I am inspired by your continued support and you give me hope that our global community can come together to finally bring social, racial justice to those who have been denied it for so long. In New York City, UPS driver Antoine Andrews helped lead more than 100 of his fellow workers in a demonstration in front of their workplace. Andrews, who has worked for UPS over 23 years in Long Island City and as a member of Teamsters Local 804, wanted to express solidarity with the Black Lives Matter movement and send a message of the inequality facing black workers, invoking the words of the late Representative John Lewis to his co-workers, asking the question, do you choose to be silent and complicit, or do you speak out and demand to be heard? It was a phenomenal day. On Monday, as you just mentioned, it was a strike for a national strike for black lives. Uh, the members, the shop stewards, the business agents, the um, executive board, they all came out in solidarity to strike for black lives. They all came out, we all came out rather, to stand up against injustice, inequity, and uh, racial systemic. It was a wonderful turnout, and I believe the message was definitely sent out. And you know, was permeated throughout the uh, facility and permeated throughout the, um, the the country, which was wonderful. And, and you played a very crucial role in the lead up, helping helping to organize this. And you know, can you talk about just staging this event? I know you were part of a live stream with our brothers and sisters at SEIU, and, and kind of what it meant to to bring workers together. Yeah, it was it was a great thing because you know a lot of members do face. Uh, Injustice and inequality uh, on the, um, the in the workplace, and you know I got with the rest of the stewards within my facility, and what we normally do when we have rallies or events like this, we um, we work together and we send out a message to our individual centers. So I'm a shop steward for over about 120 guys, and I, there's three other shop stewards within the facility who uh, represents another 100 plus guys. So what we do is we send out a blast me message to all of our guys. We put it on Facebook, and it's pretty much a lot of it 
word by mouth, word of mouth. So um, there, there was a lot of excitement. People who were saying that, you know, I'm glad that the union is standing out and standing up and speaking out for injustice and uh, racial systemic, systemic racism. So um, there are a lot of people who are happy about it. And it was a, a great sense of unity. Um, you know, for me, myself, I stand, I stand up against uh, injustice, and I believe for, I believe in what is fair, what is right, and what is just, regardless of whether it's a strike for Black Lives or, you know, whether it's a, a member who is down. You know, this is what we do: we lift each other up, and you know that is a reflection of unity and solidarity. You know, that morning I, I was online and I was reading, I stumbled across um, a quote of the great late John Lewis that states. When you see something that is unjust, something that is not fair and something that is not right, we all have a moral obligation to to do something about it, speak out about it. And this is exactly what took place in Foster Avenue in Brooklyn, New York, that particular day. Members stood up. Members were speaking out against injustice and inequity and um, systemic racism. So it was an opportunity for most people to finally say, you know, I'm going to speak out about this and not be silent. And as I mentioned in, in my speech, silence is involvement, silence is complicity. So do you choose to be silent or speak out or stand up or fall? You know, so that message was very impactful. And I believe, you know, a lot of people gained that energy and that momentum to to speak out, whether it's in, in society, injustice in society, or injustice in the workplace. Well, I think you just answered my next question, which would, what is your message moving forward? Where do we go from here? Well, where do we go from here? We, we show strength, and, and that's exactly what we did on Friday. Friday, but the, it, was a, it was a wonderful week, as I said. Uh, not to you know, derail from your question, I'll get to it. Um, you know, on Monday, as I mentioned, we started off with the, the rally for Strike for Black Lives. Uh, everyone came out. Um, most people, I should say, came out to stand up against the injustice and uh, systemic racism. On Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, we had the fat cat out in front of the facility. And that was a message to send, that we sent to the company that we will not tolerate anything that is unfair, anything that is unjust within the workforce. So where do we go from here? We continue to encourage each other to speak out, to, to encourage people, to give people that courage to not be afraid when they are affected by something that is uh, unjust, unjust. So, um, you know, we, we just continue that momentum. We keep speaking out. We keep standing up. We keep, you know, sending messages on, on Facebook to encourage people to, to stand up. You feel like it's bonded you and your coworkers together? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, last the movement that took place last week, the rallies that took place last week, definitely, definitely put a new face uh, on the union. Um, people who never had any pride about being a part of uh, the union, uh, they gained their pride that week. Uh, there were members who lost pride that regained pride last week. There were members who had pride, like myself, and my my pride is now bulky, you know, more more bulky. So, you know, it's it was a wonderful week, and I believe that definitely, definitely uh, brought change to the local and to the union, and also to society, because a strong a strong message was was sent out last week. The strike for Black Lives was also a call to action demanding elected officials and employers rewrite the rules so that black workers can thrive. In Chicago, Teamsters Local 777 President Jim Klimko gave a rousing speech to his members and other workers in Chicago about the need to stand together in the fight for justice. Today's day of action is striking for Black Lives Matter all around the country. Teamsters, other unions, other progressives are all pushing for rights. What we're asking for is justice for black communities, broadening which means re-examining healthcare, education, and more. We're asking 
asking our elected officials and candidates to use their authority to rewrite rules and reimagine the economy so black communities can thrive. We're asking corporations to take immediate action to dismantle racism, white supremacy, and economic exploitation. We want every worker to be able to form a union, no matter where they work. So, we're out here today, we know the economy can do better, we know that everybody should have health insurance, and it shouldn't be the companies paying for it, it should be our government providing that for everybody. And they should be providing jobs for everybody. There should be a minimum wage that matters for everybody. At several locations, including Detroit, Michigan, workers kneeled in silence for eight minutes and 46 seconds in honor of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and the countless other black lives who have been lost to police violence. For local 322 member Kim Campbell, who drove from Clint, Michigan to take part in the strike for black lives, joining with healthcare director Nina Bugby, the day was personal and a reminder that the fight for racial justice is far from over and that workers must stand together. We met up down in Detroit and there was another uh, union, SEIU, and the Teamsters were there and we were in support um, of the workers there and they honored the memory um, of Mr. Floyd. Um, so yeah, it was just, it was a beautiful day. It was a beautiful day. They did a moment of silence, uh, eight minutes and 46 seconds, a uh, moment of silence that was, you know, to be there in that moment and feel the time go by. It, I don't think there was a dry eye there. You know, it just made you realize how long he was down there not being able to breathe. Eight minutes and 46 seconds. I didn't, I never realized how long that was until that moment. It was a, now, nah, oh my goodness. It was something that I'll never forget. Something that I will never forget. Um, so yeah. I mean, very powerful. And I know it was, uh, you know, cities across the country, you know, you were, you were, that were doing the same thing, taking an E and, and yes. those eight minutes and 46 seconds. And anything that you want to say about what it, what it meant to your, the people that were, that you were with, I know there was a caravan of people that you, you guys came down with and, and, and yeah. how, what it felt like on the, on the ground. Well, I went down um, with another colleague of mine and her son. He was 20, I think he was 22 years old. And um, we were in the car traveling together and we were just talking about how we got here. And my mind actually goes back to my father, my father, um, and how we actually, my family actually ended up in Michigan on July 2nd, 19, 1962, when they passed the Civil Rights Bill. My father was from Alabama, and he decided to take a drink out of the white water fountain. Um, he and his cousin. And when they did that, there was a truckload of white men that pulled up and um, they started fighting. And my father and his cousin were able to fight the men off and they were able to get in their truck and they were able to get home. By the time they had reached home, um, Word had got out that my father and his cousin were going to either end up lynched that night or they were going to um, be arrested, one or the other. So my grandfather and my grandmother put my dad on a bus one way to Michigan. <laughs> and that's how we ended up. That's how my family ended up here. And so it's just like every generation. My dad, he's wanted better for me and my brother and sister. Um, and he worked to provide a better life for us. And I think somewhere along the line, 
honestly, I, I, we were having this conversation week after the bills were passed and the laws were passed and they started doing the desegregation and all of that. Um, we became complacent, I believe. And in that, you know, um, we stopped demanding um, and we just got comfortable. Even though things were continuing to happen, and I think with the social media that's out now, um, the stuff has been happening all along. I have heard so many stories within my family of injustices, um, but the spotlight has never been so bright. And even though this has happened over and over and over and has been going on for years, now with social media, it's out there and it's in everybody's face. And there was something about Mr. Floyd's death that just resonated like never before. Um, and even though it has happened before and we have all of the lives that have been lost, you know, at the hands of, at the hands of um, bad cops, um, it was a moment. It was a moment. People were upset, people marched, people shouted, people protest, but then that moment passed. But there was something about Mr. Floyd's death that turned into a movement. Uh, beautifully said, and, you know, on that front, you know, the, the timeliness of the unfortunate passing of, of yes. Lewis. And, and, you know, I know I've spoke with a lot of folks today and, and how much that impacted the day itself. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, it, you know, it just John Lewis was such a voice. We had so many voices, and like I said, we now it kind of feels like we are looking for those John Lewis's for today. Mm -hmm. Um, I have two sons, 20 and 19. And just like my dad wanted better for us. And when I was in middle school, we moved to a predominantly white neighborhood subdivision. And I went to a predominantly white middle school. And there were only maybe, I'd say, 10, 15 African-Americans at the school at the time. And I remember... Um, going to my locker my first week of school there and they had put on the, my locker on all of the black students lockers go home on a post-it note and that was actually my first time feeling as though I didn't belong feeling out of place um feeling as though there may have been something wrong just because I'm black. Mm -hmm. um, and I had to deal with quite a bit at that school. But my father, again, he's always been my backbone. And whenever I would go home and, <laughs> and tell him anything, he made sure that he was up at that school the next day. He was addressing the principals. Addressing the administration, addressing whoever he needed to address to make sure that I was treated fairly at that school. Um, and it just goes from one generation to the next. Now I have my boys that we are actually still in the same subdivision, but I, in 2020, don't feel comfortable with my sons going for a jog by themselves in my subdivision, even though we, I've been here all of my life. Not everyone knows them. There have been new families to move in. Um, and we're still the minority pretty much in the subdivision. So it makes me 
anxious when they want to go for a walk or go for a jog in our subdivision or when my son wants to get in his car and, and go for a ride. I'm, I have an app downloaded on my phone that tells me where he is at all times. And I just, you know, in, instead of us as a society being where I thought we would be in 2020, it kind of feels like we've regressed. But with the passing of Mr. Floyd, with what happened to him, like I said, it feels like the world is trying to, well, a lot of people is trying to make it right. Um, we're putting a spotlight on all of the injustices. And it's it's a movement that I'm just proud to be a part of. I just, you know, I have to ask, you know, being from Flint, where you just got, you guys just came out of a racial justice issue with the water oh, and everything. Yes. Just talk more about what you do there and, 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 and what it means to you. I am actually a respiratory therapist. I've been a respiratory therapist for 20 years at McLaren Flint. Um, oh, so you're on the front lines. I am on the front lines. I am on the front lines. And during, you know, I've seen, I've seen a lot in my 20 years, but I've never seen anything like COVID. I've never experienced anything like COVID. What we're, what we were up against, um, it was, you know, we did not have proper PPE. Um, we did not have uh, masks. We didn't have any, we didn't have anything. We were actually told that we could not wear masks for the first week or so. Um, and thank God the Teamsters stepped in and helped us get masks because I work in the emergency room and um when you talk about COVID and I don't know it just seems like black <laughs> black people we get the worst of everything <laughs> and we just it just seems like we get the worst of everything and I saw so many um, African Americans coming in there, and at one point, the entire IC was just full, and it was all African Americans and fighting for their lives, fighting for their fighting for their lives, and so many didn't make it. Unfortunately, I caught it myself, oh. and I was out of work um, for a while, and. Um, Thank God right now, the curve has started trending while well, it was going down. We had, we had hit our peak and has started going down. Now it's starting to trend up a little bit, but prayerfully it won't get as bad as it was. It's just like I said, the disparities, even in healthcare when it comes to minorities, mm -hmm. you know, um, and people were wondering why did it hit? the minority community so hard and it just pointed out a lot of disparities in healthcare um when it came to the minority community um we have a lot of underlying issues because of the disparities and you know to see it it just ravaged the community i know families that have lost 10, 12 family members. What do we do to move forward? What's your advice for, for members to, to, to take a stand and, and realize how much this matters, that Black Lives Matters is, is, is much bigger than they maybe originally thought? 
Absolutely. And I, like I said, you have to have those uncomfortable talks. You have to have those uncomfortable conversations um, because that's the only that's the only way we have. We've ignored. We have let things slide. We have let things go. We have. Um, like I said, we have a lot of big moments. I just keep going back to that. We have a lot of big moments. We have a lot of where the attention is there and then you get comfortable again and the attention goes away. Mm -hmm. You have to continue to pay attention. You have to continue to stay vigilant. You have to continue to have those uncomfortable conversations in order to get better in order to move on in order to improve that's the key that is the key we have to continue to fight together it has to continue to be important enough for people to say enough is enough and i'm not going to tolerate it it has to be important enough for and not just black people but just like with white people my white friends they have to call it out when they see it and i think that will help us create a better society. Anjali DeGrasse, Deputy Director of the Teamsters Safety and Health Department, spoke with NIOSH's Don Castillo about how truckers can protect themselves from COVID-19 including the use of proper personal protective equipment and cleaning practices. Hello, Teamster Nation. Today, we have a special guest joining us, Ms. Dawn Castillo from the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health, commonly referred to as NIOSH, which is a part of the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, or CDC. Please join me in welcoming Ms. Castillo to the Teamster Nation podcast. Thanks, Anjali, and greetings to the truck drivers out there. I very much appreciate your service to the nation and the opportunity to share recommendations made by the agency I work for, CDC NIOSH, to keep you and others safe while you work hard to meet the nation's needs. Don, we are so glad to have you on today's episode. We know CDC and NIOSH are working hard to provide the best possible guidance to frontline workers, essential workers, and the American public. The Teamsters Union represents a significant number of workers who are essential to keeping America open and running, such as our truck drivers. Today, would you please share with listeners some ways drivers may be able to protect themselves and reduce COVID-19 exposure in public places like rest stops, fueling stations, and restaurants? Absolutely. As you know, long-haul truck driving on public roads and highways can be a pleasure, but all too often, hazardous driving conditions coupled with harsh deadlines make this work challenging and risky. Recently, coronavirus disease 2019, also known as COVID-19, has added to this risk. CDC developed COVID-19 guidance for long-haul truck drivers. Our aim was to develop strategies that drivers and their employers could use to prevent infection and the spread of COVID-19. The NIOSH guidance I will discuss today is based on questions we received from trucking stakeholders, including drivers, about current industry guidance and general CDC guidance developed for businesses and employers. First, I would like to address how you can reduce exposure to COVID-19 in public spaces. As a long haul truck driver, you probably spend most of your time alone on open roads, but there always comes a time when you must pull over for gas, food, to use a restroom, to take a rest break, or to drop off a shipment. During these stops, you may come in close contact with truck stop attendants, store workers, dock workers, other truck drivers, or the public at large. Any one of these contacts could expose you to COVID-19. 
You could also become exposed when you come in contact with a frequently touched surface or object that may have been touched or handled by an infected person. And after you touch your nose, mouth, or eyes without first having sanitized or washed your hands. Now let's talk about prevention. Limiting close contact with others and maintaining a social distance of at least six feet when possible is the best way to protect yourself and others from exposure to COVID-19. If social distancing is not possible, wear a cloth face covering or disposable face mask. These may prevent you from transmitting the virus that causes COVID-19 to others during the time when you don't know that you have the virus. Many infected people do not have COVID-19 symptoms for several days before they become sick or they are not sure the symptoms are COVID-related. Consider using some additional strategies to limit your contact with others. Limit time spent outside of the truck cab during loading and unloading, fueling, and at rest stops and truck, rest areas and truck stops. Pack food, water, and supplies to limit the number of stops. Use paperless electronic invoicing for fueling, deliveries, and other tasks. When outside the cab, avoid touching surfaces often touched by others. Use disinfecting wipes, if available, on handles and buttons before you touch them. If wipes are not available, you can use a spray bottle containing 70% alcohol cleaning solution and paper towel. Contact facilities in advance to make an appointment for unloading cargo. Also, be aware that some facilities may not grant access to restrooms, so plan as best you can. Use radios and phones to talk with dock managers or other drivers when possible. Don't shake hands. Do not share personal items such as vests, safety glasses, hard hats, tools, phones, or radios. If you have ride-along passengers or if you are team driving, wear cloth face coverings or disposable face masks inside the truck and avoid sharing bedding in the sleeper berth. Keep the truck well ventilated, using the cab vents to bring in fresh outside air or lower the windows. Locate truck stops, rest areas, and hotels along your route that are open, stop, and follow recommended COVID-19 safety practices. Many facilities publicize that they are following CDC guidelines on their websites and premises, and we encourage carriers to pre-qualify or recommend facilities for you to use. We recommend that truck stops practice routine cleaning, provide hand sanitizing stations, use proper food handling, replace self-service with full service, and offer contactless fuel payment. If any of these elements are not available, use extra caution. Practicing proper hand hygiene is important for prevention. Proper hand hygiene will help prevent infection. Wash your hands regularly with soap and water for at least 20 seconds, or use a hand sanitizer containing at least 60% alcohol if soap and water are not readily available. Make sure to clean your hands at the following time, before entering and leaving the cab, before eating or preparing food, after putting on, touching, or removing cloth face coverings or disposable face masks, after blowing your nose, coughing or sneezing, and after using the restroom. You are looking after the nation. Don't forget to look after yourself. Stay safe by maintaining social distance. Wear a cloth face covering or disposable face mask when you can't. Disinfect commonly touched surfaces and wash your hands frequently. Thank you, Dawn, for that information on how our drivers can protect themselves and reduce their exposures. I also like to thank you especially for the note about pre-qualified truck stops. That's important. You mentioned disinfection of commonly touched surfaces, which is of great interest to our listeners. Can you go into a little more detail on recommended cleaning and disinfection procedures? Certainly. On a daily basis, make it part of your routine to clean and disinfect the 10 most commonly touched areas in the vehicle. The cab and trailer door handle, 
steering wheel and gear shift, seat belt and buckle, arm and headrest, seat cover, turn signal, wiper controls, dashboard and electronic logging devices, air ducts, and radio and temperature controls. Next, move on to the sleeper berth and wipe down light switches, the mattress tray, temperature controls, and other flat surfaces. If a third party has access to the interior of your truck, like mechanics, other drivers, or inspectors, request that they clean and disinfect the truck before turning it back over to you. You should follow cleaning and disinfection procedures consistently and correctly. Provide adequate ventilation when using chemicals and keep your doors and windows open when cleaning the vehicle. Wear disposable gloves compatible with the cleaning products being used and any other protective equipment required according to the product manufacturer's instructions, such as a disposable gown if available and recommended. Wash hard, non-porous surfaces within the interior of the vehicle, like gear shifts, hard seats, armrests, and door handles, among many, that are visibly dirty with detergent or soap and water prior to applying a disinfectant. Use recommended chemicals to disinfect these surfaces. These include EPA's registered antimicrobial products for use against the virus that causes COVID-19, which are available on EPA's website. Follow the manufacturer's instructions for concentration, application, and time. You can also use diluted household bleach solutions prepared according to the manufacturer's label for disinfection. Follow manufacturer's instructions for application and proper ventilation. Check to ensure that the product has not expired and never mix household bleach with ammonia or any other cleanser. Alcohol-based solutions should contain at least 70% alcohol. To clean and disinfect soft or porous surfaces, such as fabric sheets, fabric seats rather, Remove any visible contamination with appropriate cleaners for pore surfaces. After cleaning, use products that are EPA approved for use against the virus that causes COVID-19 and suitable for pore surfaces. EPA approved products are available on their website. For frequently touched electronic surfaces, such as tablets or touch screens, remove visible dirt, then disinfect following manufacturer's instructions. If no manufacturer guidance is available, consider the use of alcohol-based wipes or sprays containing at least 70% alcohol to disinfect. Do not forget about other frequently used and commonly shared objects in your cleaning and disinfection routine, such as clipboards, pens and pencils, barcode scanning devices, dollies and handcarts. Remember to remove and dispose of gloves and any other disposable protective equipment used for cleaning and disinfecting the cab. Wash your hands immediately after with soap and water for at least 20 seconds, or use an alcohol-based hand sanitizer with at least 60% alcohol if soap and water are not available. If you did not wear a disposable gown to disinfect, launder your work clothes using the warmest appropriate water setting and dry the items completely. Don't forget to wash your hands after handling laundry. Before you leave on your long haul delivery, make sure to have the following supplies stocked in your truck. Dis disposable disinfectant wipes, 60% or greater alcohol-based sanitizers for cleaning your hands, a small trash bag for disposal of used tissues and wipes, cloth face coverings or disposable face masks, personal protective equipment, such as reflective vests, safety glasses, or hard hats, so you don't have to borrow items from others. Stay safe on the road. Make cleaning and disinfection a normal part of your routine. Thank you again, Don. These cleaning and disinfection recommendations are very helpful and something drivers should be doing on a routine basis to ensure they are reducing their exposures as much as possible.
I especially like to point out that you said 70% alcohol solution is required for disinfecting and at least 60% are greater alcohol solution is required for sanitizers. One last area I was hoping you could discuss with us um, in the podcast segment are the risk for illness and what to do if you do become sick. Absolutely. It's both an honor and a burden when everybody depends on you. While many Americans shelter in place, you have been on the road keeping supply chains open and store shelves stocked. As a long haul truck driver, you are a frontline worker, essential for the well being of the nation. Your personal well being and health are also important. The pandemic has brought new concerns about long haul drivers' health and safety on the road. Your company should develop a plan to address what to do if you become sick while on the road. The plan should include who to contact, where to stop, where and how to seek medical advice and treatment, and strategies for freight delivery. Be sure to discuss the plan with your local union and family so that everyone is informed. Notify your supervisor and stay at home if you have symptoms, which include fever or chills, cough, shortness of breath, fatigue, muscle pain, sore throat, or new loss of taste or smell. If you are confirmed to have COVID-19 infection, your company should inform fellow employees of their possible exposure while maintaining your confidentiality under the American Disabilities Act or ADA. Follow CDC recommended steps if you are sick. Consult with healthcare providers and state and local health departments to determine when to return to work. If you are well but have a sick family member at home with COVID-19, follow CDC precautions for drivers who have sick family members. Continue to comply with current Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration regulations. Use the following strategies to stay healthy and alert on the job. Get seven to nine hours of sleep before driving. This is critical even when essential supplies and equipment are being transported. Pull over, drink a cup of coffee, or take a 15 to 30 minute nap before continuing if you feel fatigued while driving. Keep in mind, some people are at higher risk for more serious complications from COVID-19. Workers at higher risk include older adults, and people of any age with underlying medical conditions, such as heart disease, hypertension, diabetes, chronic lung disease, moderate to severe asthma, weakened immunity, or severe obesity, among many. While employers shouldn't make medical inquiries about your health, you can talk to your employer if you are at higher risk for severe illness from COVID-19. The CDC encourages special considerations for at-risk workers, including flexible sick leave and supportive policies and practices if sick leave is not offered. In this case, some employers may offer non-punitive sick leave. CDC recommends that your employer put in place specific policies to minimize your face-to-face contact between drivers, other workers, and clients. Employers should avoid adding to your medical worries. This means compliance with the American Disabilities Act and Age Discrimination and Employment Act regulations. While some drivers have underlying health conditions, some drivers also have family members at home with health conditions. If you have an at-risk family member, you probably fear catching the virus on the road and bringing it home. Going home can be complicated. Become informed on how the virus spreads. Follow our guidelines and use the strategies presented in our podcast to minimize your risk. The information I provided, as well as other recommendations for drivers, is included in a CDC fact sheet developed specifically for long-haul truck drivers. The fact sheet is available in English, Spanish, and other languages. More information is available from CDC. Visit our website at cdc.gov forward slash coronavirus for more information or contact the CDC 
at 1-800-CDC-INFO or 1-800-232-4634. Thank you for your interest and commitment to stopping the spread of COVID-19 in our communities. We are in this together, and together we can make a difference. We are in this together. I want to thank you, um, the CDC, NIOSH, and Ms. Castillo for sharing this valuable information. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Teamsters podcast. The Teamsters want all of our members to stay safe and well during the coronavirus pandemic. The Teamsters podcast will be moving back to its original monthly schedule beginning in August. So keep an ear out for more episodes from America's Strongest Union. And be sure to check out www.teamster.org regularly for updates.